hello uh, to everybody. Uh, good morning in Spain and good afternoon in China. Uh, my name is uh, Amadeo Gensana and I'm the director of the business department at Casa Asia. Uh, welcome to this webinar co-organized by uh, Cuatro Casas, the lawyer firm, and Casa Asia. Uh, this webinar on tax updates impacting on Sino-Spanish businesses. And we will analyze, analyze basically two things. Uh, one of them is the double taxation agreement between Spain and China that uh, recently actually came into force on May the 2nd. And uh, this is an update of the previous agreement uh, that actually uh, uh, was, was signed in year 1990. And uh, well, there are a lot of new things in this agreement regarding uh, actually permanent establishments or uh, dividends or interest, et cetera. So I think it's, it's worth and it's interesting for uh, all the Spanish companies operating in China uh, and also just Chinese companies operating in Spain. But also uh, we will uh, analyze uh, other actually tax updates impacting on Sino-Spanish businesses. And uh, for this purpose, uh, actually, we will count on the cooperation of four lawyers uh, from Cuatro Casas. Uh, before that, uh, actually, I would like to, uh, to remind to all the participants that uh, if there's any question uh, related to the seminar, actually, uh, at, the, at the bottom side of, uh, of, of the Zoom, of your Zoom, actually, you have a, well, uh, a button. Uh, saying actually Q&A or preguntas y respuestas. Uh, you can send directly actually your, your question there, or please uh, feel free to write to the, your questions to this, uh, to this uh, actually uh, email address, webinars.cuatrecasas.com. Uh, so both are okay. And uh, as I said before, actually we have here today with us, we count on the participation of four uh, actually speakers from, from Cuatro Casas. Uh, first of all, just Brigida Cal Cal Galvete, who's counsel at Cuatro Casas. She's an expert in international tax planning and business restructuring. Uh, and she was uh, actually assigned to the Shanghai office of Cuatro Casas from year 2011 to year 2014. And uh, well, she's now in Barcelona and she continues her practice in tax advice uh, with an international focus. And she's also a member of the Cuatro Casas Asian desk. Uh, also, uh, we count today on the participation of Conchi Bargallo. Uh, she specializes in tax advising and planning for large multinational business groups. And uh, also she was assigned actually to uh, Cuatro Casas Shanghai office from November 2014 to December 2017. And she has an extensive uh, expert expertise advising, uh, advising on indirect uh, taxation, corporate income tax consolidation uh, regime transfer pricing and permanent establishments. Uh, also, we count uh, with the participation of Grace Lin, in this case from Shanghai. Uh, she has been providing tax advice for over a decade to make multinational uh, company, uh, company groups uh, on international and domestic transactions, as well as to foreign uh, uh, working expatriates uh, in China. And she has an extensive uh, advice uh, in planning for cross-border and domestic tax sections and the tax implications uh, and uh, also an, on m &A, transfer pricing, etc. And uh, also uh, we count on the participation of Ana Jorge. Uh, she's associate at Cuatro Casas uh, and she's a specialist in advising on tax uh, in relation to cross-border transactions in areas such as foreign investment in Spain, Spanish investments abroad, and restructuring multinational uh, groups. Uh, Ana Jorge also was assigned to the Shanghai office uh, of Cuatro Casas from November 2017 to March 2020. And after this short uh, introduction, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Brigida Galbete. Brigida, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amadeo, and, and thank you all, all the audience for attending this webinar. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do a brief introduction about this new tax treaty between China and Spain. It was signed uh, in Madrid in, on the 28th of November, 2018, 
after more than three years of negotiations. And let me read you the, the title of the treaty. It is Agreement between the People's Republic of China and the Kingdom of Spain for the Elimination of Double Taxation with Respect to Taxes on Income and the Prevention of Tax Evasion and Avoidance. So this title already announces one change of the treaty, which is that it only covers income taxes. It does not cover wealth tax, uh, which is a tax that only exists in Spain and not in China. And this uh, mainly implies that Chinese tax residents own in assets in Spain for which they may have uh, wealth tax obligations here in Spain uh, will not be protected by the tax treaty anymore. So in Spain, this tax treaty was published in the official Gazette on the 13th of March uh, of 2021. And it started uh, from uh, the 2nd of May 2021, the new tax treaty overrides the previous one uh, of 1990. Um, at least this is true in Spain, uh, because we have to warn that as far as we know, uh, the new tax treaty has not been published in China yet. And this involves that in practice is not being applicable uh, or applied by the tax authorities uh, in China at this moment. So, although we expect that the, the state administration of taxation uh, will publish it soon. But this is one of the asymmetries that we have identified in relation to the application of the treaty. Uh, one important highlight is that the new tax treaty rests on the new model uh, tax convention of the OECD, as opposed to the previous tax treaty of 1990 that was based on the model of the United Nations, as many other tax treaties that China had entered into in the 80s and the 90s. And this uh, op leaves open the question uh, as to what extent the internal interpretations that China has been issuing uh, for the application of the tax treaty remains applicable to the new tax treaty. And uh, we will contribute our views uh, on this point during the webinar. So landing on specific provisions of the tax treaty, I would highlight the importance uh, that for investors of the both countries uh, will have changes to Article 5 on permanent establishment and Article 10 on dividends. Of course, there are also many other changes and we will cover what we think they are the most relevant ones during this session. Um, so I leave the floor now to my colleagues, uh, Conti and Grace, who will start presenting what is new in the permanent establishment rules. Thank you, Brigida. So as you all know, the general rule with, with international taxation is that the profits that one company obtains may only be taxed in the state where it is tax resident, unless it has a, per, a permanent establishment in the other state. And this is why it is relevant to, to know what has been changed in the treaty regarding permanent establishments and, and to assess whether we will be affected by these changes and whether this will mean that we need to pay taxes in China as Spanish companies doing businesses there or the other way around. So the new treaty keeps the four types of permanent establishments that are well already in force under the former treaty. These four types are the fixed place of business permanent establishment, the construction permanent establishment, the service permanent establishment, and the uh, dependent agent permanent establishment. The first one remains unchanged. The other ones has, have undergone some uh, slight, changes, slight changes in some cases and some other very relevant changes for, for some of the permanent establishment uh, categories. And uh, all of these changes are in line with the trends in the international context. As, as Brigida was mentioning, uh, this new treaty relies on the OECD tax model convention. So uh, what, what this treaty represents is uh, an, an aim at capturing the, the intentionality of the companies rather than relying only in mere formalities and therefore to prevent uh, companies from avoiding the creation of a permanent establishment merely on, on these on this, on this formality issues. So Grace, uh, maybe before we start with the changes, you can give us some practical insights on what it means to have a permanent establishment in China. 
Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, before we dive into each specific type of uh, permanent establishment, I want to first mention some practical considerations in China. So when a permanent establishment is created in China, corporate income tax at 25% will be levied on the business profit attributable to the permanent establishment by filing periodical returns. So the general rule is that business profit is attributed to the permanent establishment according to the functions performed and the risk assumed, and by keeping the accounting books and the supporting documents. However, the general rule is very difficult to apply to most types of permanent establishment. Therefore, in practice, the business profit is attributed according to the a deemed profit method. Take service provision as an example. If a permanent establishment is created through service provision, the business profit is deemed at 15% to 50% of the service income, depending on the types of the services and at the discretion of the Chinese tax authorities. And this result is in turn taxed at the 25%. Thank you, Grace. So, so therefore, to, to a big extent, what we can say is that China has a great discretion on determining uh, what the taxation of a, of a permanent establishment is. And one could think that this is not, this is not relevant, that the way that China interprets the, the permanent establishment concept or the way it determines how uh, its taxation must be calculated is not relevant because uh, from the Spanish perspective, if we have a permanent establishment in China, we will be granted with an, ex with an exemption for uh, corporate income tax purposes. Well, this is true, but if uh, taxation in China is irregular, we could eventually have the exemption challenged. So this is something that we, that we need to uh, look at uh, carefully and make sure that uh, what we are paying in China, for instance, in this case, is correct and that we will not have any problems uh, in Spain. Also, uh, I must point out that when we have a permanent establishment created, the personnel, the staff assigned to work for it will have uh, personal income tax obligations in the country where the permanent establishment is. So this is also a relevant issue to take into consideration, perhaps when we are offering someone to, to, to be seconded to, to, to work abroad. So let's go into the, into the changes uh, in the concept of, the, of, of permanent establishment. The first change is related to the construction, installation and assembly works uh, permanent establishment. And in this case, the duration has been increased from six months uh, to 12 months. And this is completely in line with the habitual provisions in other treaties. Uh, we must note that no specific anti-abuse provision has been included in the, in the wording of the treaty to avoid the splitting of the overall project into smaller projects as to avoid uh, meeting the 12 month threshold. However, as Grace will explain now, uh, this is something that is already applicable through uh, domestic uh, internal anti-avoidance rules. Okay, so uh, from the Chinese perspective here, I want to introduce you the counting rules for the 12 month period. According to our domestic interpretation on tax treaty, which may continue to apply given it's already in line with the OECD commentary in this aspect. So rule number one, a site exists from the date on which the contractor begins his work, including any preparatory work until the work is completed and the labor and the equipment or materials are fully withdrawn from the site, including any trial operation. Rule number two, if a general contractor which has undertaken the performance of a comprehensive project subcontracts all or parts of such project, to other subcontractors, the period spent, spent by the subcontractor working on the building site must be considered as time being spent by the general contractor on the building project for the purpose of determining whether a permanent establishment exists for the general contractor. On the other hand, the subcontractor itself has a permanent establishment at the site if its activities there last more than 12 months. Rule number three, 
to avoid abuse through contract splitting, projects split through multiple contracts that are commercially and geographically integrated will be considered as a building site or construction or installation project and are counted together when determining whether a permanent establishment exists. So rule number four, temporary discontinuance is disregarded. Therefore, seasonal interruptions such as bad weather and the temporary interruptions such as shortage of materials or labor difficulties should be included in determining the life of the site. However, regarding the interruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, our domestic interpreta uh, interpretation provides that during uh, the duration of a full suspension of activities due to the COVID-19 pandemic will not be included when determining whether a permanent establishment exists. So this interpretation is more relaxed than that from the OECD, which includes such uh, interruptions. Back to you, Kongji. Thank you, Grace. So one last remark regarding this type of permanent establishment. If you look at the, at the wording of the new treaty, you will see that the reference to the inspection or supervisory activities of this type of projects has been deleted from Article 5. However, uh, this should still be considered within the scope of Article 5. And, um, and, um, and this, this interpretation relies on the wording of the commentaries to the uh, OECD uh, tax model convention, where it's specifically stated that this kind of superv supervisory or inspection activities are still considered within the, within the scope of, of the construction permanent establishment. So let's move to, to, the, to the second change. And this one is related to the service, services permanent establishments. The service PE, as we call it, is a special type of permanent establishment that comes directly from the United Nations Model Tax Convention. This is something that is uh, sometimes some fairly uncommon for, for, for Spanish comments, for Spanish companies. Uh, we, are, we are not that used to this concept, but it is really uh, very common for China uh, as it, it took this, this, this approach as a developing um, country in the past. And it's something that it includes in, in mostly all, all of its uh, tax treaties. So this is something that we, that, we, that we need to know and that we need to review because uh, we, we are not that familiar with this concept from a Spanish perspective. So we, know, we need to look ahead and see if we can fall within, within the scope of this permanent establishment. So when do we have a service permanent establishment? We have it when we have, when we as a non-resident company send uh, people, send our staff to work and to provide services to others, to the other state or hired third party staff to do so. And in doing so, we spend in the other state a period exceeding 183 days with any period of 12 months in relation to the same project or in relation to different connected projects. So the change here is related to the, to the time frame, to the time reference, where the former treaty read six months we now read 183 days. This is something that in practical terms was already being, uh, being applied. So Spain was already considering that six months was equivalent to 183 days. China, it took a little bit more for China to, to adapt to this interpretation, but it has been applying this interpretation for the uh, last uh, couple of years at least. So Grace, maybe you can give us uh, some more insight about how China interprets this concept. Yeah, sure. So uh, sometimes foreign companies may try to avoid creating a service permanent establishment in China uh, by splitting the projects into different contracts. So as the treaty provides, connected projects shall be counted together in this aspect. So the determination of whether projects are connected will depend on the facts and the circumstances of each case. Factors that may specially be relevant for this purpose include whether these projects are covered by one framework contract, 
If not, whether the contracts covering different projects are concluded with the same person or related persons, whether the execution of one project is the precondition of the other, or whether the nature of the work involved under the different contracts is the same or similar, whether the same employees are performing the activities under the different contracts. So if the answer is yes to all these questions, it is very likely these projects are considered connected when determining the existence of a service permanent establishment in China. Thank you, Grace. So uh, in the picture you can see in the slide, we were trying to show two types of works, uh, two types of services being rendered in China. Uh, if the works in red and the works in gray can be considered uh, a same project or a connected project, then this company providing the services will have a permanent establishment in China. However, if they can be considered as separate, no permanent establishment uh, will exist. It is important to know that once we fall within the, the creation of a permanent establishment for services, uh, this will apply to the full provision of the services. So it will not apply only in the year where we spend more than 183 days. It will have effects for past periods and also for future periods. And as I mentioned, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it will also have effects on the expatriates that we have assigned to go uh, to work uh, to China or to Spain in relation to, to this project. So uh, the next the next changes that uh, that were that have been introduced by by the treaty are related to the dependent agent definition. Uh, here, as most of you will know, uh, the the definition under the former treaty was a, a formal um, definition relied very much in formalities and could be avoided based on formalities although judgments and interpretations in both countries would, uh, mod would modulate this, 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 this purely formal uh, definition. And what we have changed now, what we have in the new treaty, is that we adopt a substance approach, a substance over the form approach, in line with the changes in this article in the OECD model tax convention. So now a uh, dependent agent also includes someone that has no powers to conclude contracts, but that plays a, a, a key and leading role in the negotiation of contracts. And that, uh, and that basically carries out all the, all the relevant part of the transactions, although someone else is finally uh, signing the contract without any substantial alteration. So this is now included. And the other relevant change is that uh, the former uh, definition only contemplated uh, direct representation. So those cases in which the agent was uh, acting in the name of the non-resident company. With this change, indirect, it, uh, in the indirect representation is also included. So we can also cover uh, within this concept, those cases in which the agent acts in its own name, but on behalf of the non-resident company. Uh, this is, this, this is, is something relevant because uh, with a dependent agent, uh, a lot of times we find that we move in, in gray areas uh, and based on the more formalistic approach that, 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 that was applicable before, uh, these gray areas have been dealt with or have been defined in a certain way. But for, for sure, with this change, we, we need to look uh, back again into, into our way of doing business in China and Spain, respectively, and see if we can fall within, the, within this definition now. And finally, there's a, there's a last change with regards to the, to the concept of permanent establishment. As I mentioned, there's these four types of permanent establishment, but there's also a list of exceptions. So even if you fall within the definition of a permanent establishment, if your activities are preparatory or auxiliary, or if you have an independent status as an agent, 
there will be no permanent establishment. So this is also amended, this list of exceptions or exclusions, it's also amended based on a substance over the form approach. So the, the first change is that uh, auxiliary and preparatory activities will lose this nature, will, will no longer uh, be considered as auxiliary and preparatory if uh, combined with other activities that the non-resident company is, is, is performing or then another closely related company is performing. When combined all together, they, have, um, they conform a cohesive business approach uh, sorry, a cohesive business, um, a, cohesive, a cohesive business, and um, and therefore must be considered as going beyond ancillary. So if this happens, we will have a permanent establishment. This 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 used to happen a, a lot. For example, we would have a, we we would uh, see some companies having partial operations through permanent establishments, then through subsidiaries. And the, the part that they were go doing directly would fall under the list of exceptions. And what, the, what has been changed now is that we have to look to the overall operations. So, um, so activities that before would benefit from the, from the exemptions now may no longer be covered by, by this list of exclusions. The other change that I was saying is regarding the independent agent status. And what the article clarifies is that when you have an, uh, an agent that is acting exclusively or almost exclusively on behalf of one uh, non-resident company or, or more than one, if they are closely related, will not be able to call himself an independent agent. So uh, now I will leave the floor to Anna and she will uh, speak uh, about a very long awaited and long expected uh, change in the, in the treaty that is related to, to dividends. All yours, Anna. Thanks, Conchi. Another of the, of the major changes that Brigida already announced relates to article on dividends. Dividend withholding tax rate has been reduced to 5% when the company receiving the dividend has at least 25% of the company paying the dividend for at least 365 days prior to the dividend distribution. As you may imagine, this will have a major impact because of its cost saving effect. However, the dividend recipient should also be considered as its beneficial owner. So no, the Spanish legislation, neither the tax treaty defines what does uh, beneficial owner mean. So from a Spanish perspective, we would take into account the commentaries and interpretation issued by the OCDE together with the case law of the European Court of Justice. Many of you for sure have been heard about the Danish cases. Well, um, nevertheless, uh, the, the beneficial owner concept has been uh, established and defined in the Chinese domestic law. Oh, yes, correct, Anna. So in China, beneficial owner is defined as a person who owns and controls the income or the rights of property based on which the income, such as dividends, interest, and the royalties, is generated. So when assessing the beneficial owner identity, it takes a comprehensive approach according to the actual situations of each specific case. So in terms of uh, dividends, our domestic regulation lists three negative factors which are not in favor of assessing the identity of beneficial owner. So factor one is that the recipient must pay 50% or more income obtained within 12 months of receiving it to the residents of a third country or region. So this situation happened quite often in the past when a resident company of a third country invested in China through a Hong Kong structure to take the advantage of the reduced rate on dividends between mainland China and Hong Kong. So in such case, the beneficial owner identity was often challenged by the Chinese tax authorities. Uh, 
So factor two is the uh, recipient's business activities do not constitute substantive business activities. It also points out that the recipient's uh, substantive investment holding and management activities may be considered substantive business activities. So factor three is the recipient's country or region does not levy tax or grant tax exemption on income obtained or levied at, uh, or levies tax at a very low rate. I also want to point here that an agent or a designated payee of the recipient will not be considered as a beneficiary owner. Furthermore, our domestic regulation also provides safe harbor rules for assessing beneficial owner identity. Take Spain as an example. To apply the reduced rate for dividends, the government, listed resident companies, and the resident individuals of Spain are automatically considered as the beneficial owner. Also, those 100% directly or indirectly owned by the above person or persons are also automatically considered the beneficial owner. In the case of indirect holding, the intermediary companies must be residents of China or Spain. So another important rule relating to the beneficial owner identity is the same country and the same treaty benefit rule, which was introduced in 2018 and considered groundbreaking. It provides that where the entity receiving the dividends does not qualify itself as the beneficial owner of dividends, it can still be considered beneficial owner if its investors directly or indirectly holding 100% of its equity qualify as beneficial owners based on the provided criteria and the one of the following conditions are met. Condition one, the investor and entity receiving the dividends are residents of the same country or region in respective of the residence of any intermediary holding company. Condition two, where the investor is not a resident of the same country as the entity receiving the dividends, the investor and the intermediary holding company, if that is the case, is entitled to the same or more preferential tax treaty benefit under the treaty between its same its state of residence and China. So we can see an example in the next slide. So the entity re receiving the dividends from China is a tax resident in Hong Kong and its investor is from Spain. So even if the Hong Kong entity fails the beneficial owner test, basically because it is a mere conduit entity in the structure, given that now the China-Spain tax treaty applies the same reduced rate as for the case of the China-Hong Kong agreement, the Hong Kong entity can qualify as the beneficiary owner and apply the 5% reduced rate as long as the Spanish investor passes the beneficial owner test itself. So at least from purely this perspective, this clause provides flexibility to consider whether there may be any commercial, financial or business interest in channeling, channeling this type of investment through Hong Kong. For instance, there is no foreign exchange control in Hong Kong opposite to China. However, there are also other tax considerations from the Spanish perspective. Anna will explain further. Thanks, Grace. Well, from a purely Spanish tax perspective, a reference should be made to dividend and capital gains domestic exemption together with the anti-abuse rule called a CFC regime. Well, before starting, please note that the following comments are not applicable to companies with tax residency in the Basque country. But for the rest of us, until 2020, if certain requirements were fulfilled, dividends received from China or from Hong Kong were fully exempted in, fully exempt in Spain. This means we didn't pay corporate income tax in Spain as a consequence of these dividends. However, since January 2021, 1.25 effective taxation applies. So, for example, if I'm receiving 1 million euro dividend, I will need to pay a 12,500 euro corporate income tax in Spain. So, uh, considering what Grace has explained before, 
we could think that having a, Hong, uh, a holding company in Hong Kong is a good idea because uh, we will not face any trouble with the tax bureau in China because of the beneficial owner concept. And we will be able to choose when we want to pay the 1.25 corporate income tax in, in Spain, or even if we want to pay it at all, because we can, it's as easy as decide when we want to distribute the dividend from Hong Kong to Spain. However, Spanish anti-abuse rules should be considered and in particular the, the CFC regime. Well, uh, as per the CFC regime, as it is en envisaged, it will be implemented as soon as the Anti-Fraud Act is finally passed. But in principle, income from passive um, investment, dividends and interest are considered passive investments, may be attributed to the Spanish company. And the two premises. First one is control, which means owning at least 50% of the company directly or indirectly, and minimum taxation, which means that the taxes that uh, I'm paying in Hong Kong are lower than 75% of the amount resulting from the application of the Spanish corporate income tax. So I guess that if we are setting up a holding company in Hong Kong is because in Hong Kong we are not paying corporate income tax at all. So we will need to uh, compare 0% corporate income tax in Hong Kong versus 1.25% corporate income tax in Spain. So the two premises are met and we will fall under the CFC regime. And um, as a consequence, we will need to declare two times the Chinese dividend for the purposes of the corporate income tax in Spain. The first time we will need to declare this dividend would be the fiscal year when the dividend is paid from China to Hong Kong. And the second time we will need to declare this dividend in our Spanish corporate income tax is the year in which the dividend is distributed from Hong Kong to Spain. And furthermore, as a consequence of, of the CFC regime, when uh, the capital gains obtained in the exit could not benefit from the domestic exemption. So, uh, as, you, as you see, setting up a holding company in Hong Kong right now, it's not that such a good idea. And as you can imagine, uh, this analysis should be done um, for each situation and for each stu structure by taking into account the specific circumstances uh, of its structure. Given said that, uh, we highly recommend investing directly from, directly from Spain and take advantage of the uh, deferral regime, well, the domestic deferral regime on withholding taxes related to dividends. Yeah, that's correct, Anna. So China has a tax deferral regime on the withholding tax when dividends uh, from China are used for reinvestment in China. So if foreign investors use the distributed dividends to directly reinvest in non-prohibited projects in China and meet certain conditions, the withholding tax will not have to be paid at the time the dividends are distributed. Instead, it can be uh, deferred to a later stage. So uh, please bear in mind that the nature of this uh, tax policy is tax deferral, not tax exemption. So when the foreign investors uh, retract their investments in China, for example, through equity transfer or liquidation in the future, they will need to make up the deferred uh, withholding tax allowed under this policy. I would like to, to remark that from a purely Spanish perspective, even though these dividends or the cash never leaves China, technically speaking, we have distributed a dividend. So we have to pay the 1.25% corporate income tax in Spain. Well, again, this 1.25% this corporate income tax it does not apply for those companies that are tax resident in the vast country. 
Okay, thank you, Anna and, and Grace. So uh, now we uh, are going to talk about uh, other provisions on capital income that have been amended. I refer to interest and, and royalties. In both cases, the, withhold, the maximum withholding tax of 10% has been as a general rule maintained, the same as the old tax treaty, uh, but the changes relate on the one hand in relation to interest. Uh, the, it has been introduced an exemption for interest that are payable in connection with the sale of uh, commercial or scientific equipment on credit. And on the other hand, in relation to royalties, uh, before it was established that the fees for the rental of equipment uh, of a commercial, scientific, or industrial uh, nature were considered or unqualified as such royalties and therefore to, subject to the 10% uh, withholding tax. Well, now uh, this uh, has been erased and uh, those fees do not qualify as royalties uh, anymore, which is a very welcome measure and especially for the manufacturing industry. So now Anna and Grace uh, are going to introduce some practical aspects uh, about the application of the tax treaty, uh, which mostly affect in practice uh, to the application of these um, reduced 5% withholding tax and dividends and the exemption on interest in the case I just explained. Thanks, Brigida. Well, as Brigida has mentioned, Chinese domestic law established a 10% withholding tax on dividends royalties and interest. Therefore, it's very important to know how to proceed when we have the right to apply a reduced rate. For example, in the case of, of dividends, we have the right to apply a 5% and the domestic law establishes a 10% withholding tax. Or even better, when we have the right, according to the tax treaty, to not pay taxes at all in China. Um, well, from the Chinese perspective, even though an authorization procedure for the application of the tax treaty benefits is uh, not applicable in China anymore, there are still certain formalities to observe. So in a nutshell, the taxpayer or its withholding agent needs to file a simple form with the Chinese tax authorities. In addition, depending on the specific tax treaty benefit, non resident taxpayers need to keep the relevant materials for future review, including tax residency certificate issued by the local tax authorities, and the relevant contracts, board resolution, uh, shareholder resolution, uh, payment proof, etc., and also the proof of qualifying uh, as the beneficial owner for the provisions on dividends, interest, and royalties. Other relevant documents necessary to prove the qualifications to apply the treaty benefits, for example, to claim there is no permanent establishment in China, entry and exit record of employees working in China may, still be, may be needed. And in addition to, uh, the, to, to that, uh, when non-resident companies provide services in China, they also need to go through the procedures of non-resident company temporary registration and also contract registration. Also, when any single payment is made above 50,000 US dollars, Due to the foreign exchange control in China, the local payers will also need to make a filing for the cross-border payment. Great, so now we are going to continue with uh, aspects related to the uh, taxation and capital gains. There are major changes here. And the first one relates to the transfer of real estate entities. Well, the definition of what a real estate entity is has been amended and is now aligned to the OECD model tax convention, uh, which as a matter of fact, also is coincident with the Chinese domestic uh, definition. So now a real estate entity uh, is defined as the one derivative more than 50% of its value directly or indirectly from movable property uh, located in one of the two contracting states. So uh, before the definition under the old tax treaty was, uh, let's say, more simple. It just mentioned that a real estate company was the one, the, uh, the, the, the principal asset of which was composed directly of, or indirectly by immovable properties. Um, nothing is said about what 
uh, value means in this context? I mean, uh, it, should we take the asset value or is it possible to, to take into consideration the market value? And also is uh, this an analysis of the valuation that we need to do on a standalone basis or can we consider uh, uh, the consolidated figures uh, when we are talking about a company that is uh, holding other, other shares in other entities? So um, I think that this will very much depend on the interpretation that its country it makes uh, on this clause and uh, these interpretations might not be necessarily coincident. Uh, we notice that it is not relevant the location of the company that is holding the real estate property. It can be a company located in any jurisdiction different than Spain or China and it is not relevant the percentage uh, of the shareholding that is being uh, transferred. So no matter how little or big this percentage is, so that this company, this this uh, clause and provision may apply. So uh, I'm going to uh, let Grace explain to us and with an example how to calculate this 50% threshold in an indirect situation. Yes, okay. So under China's uh, domestic interpretation, uh, when we calculate the 50%, we need to consider the indirect holding companies as well. For example, in this structure, when the Spain code A transfers its equity in the China code B, to calculate the real estate value of China code B, not only its own real estate is counted, but also the real estate value of China code C is subsidiary needs to be counted based on its participation. Thank you, Grace. So uh, in addition, uh, there is a domestic interpretation in China according to which this 50% threshold is computed considering the three years previous to the transfer. So this means that uh, if in any of these three years previous to the transfer, the company qualifies as a real estate entity according to the provisions of the tax treaty, then China retains the taxation rights. And well, particularly, I, I don't know how this will be in, interpreted in practice, but I don't think that uh, this interpretation, this domestic interpretation should be applied uh, just simply because it exceeds the scope of the provision of the tax treaty. Um, there is also one important uh, change here, which is uh, the, in, the, the, the consideration that um, the properties that are being used to exercise the business of the company are disregarded for the computation of this 50%. This is a very important clause that, uh, for example, in the case of Spain has been included in a number of uh, tax treaties uh, in, with the tax, in the tax treaty with Switzerland, for example. But this is the first time uh, China includes this provision in a tax treaty. Um, however, it seems that this uh, analysis of this consideration needs to be done just uh, from a standalone perspective. It means just considering the entity itself. So it may not prevent from taxation the, uh, the situation of groups of companies in which one of the entity is holding the asset and the other one is uh, exploiting the business. Um, and this is a very a common business model in some industries like the, the hotel industry. Um, leaving uh, behind these uh, real estate entities, uh, there is also this uh, substantial uh, shareholding provision, uh, which means that when transferring shares in uh, any other type of entity, uh, if the transfer holds uh, at least 25% of the shareholding directly or indirectly, then the state of shores keeps the taxing rights. And this is a provision that uh, was also included in the, in the old tax treaty. Uh, the, the, the new thing here is the inclusion of a time frame of 365 days uh, before the transfer. So if at any moment during this time frame, uh, the uh, transfer on, transferor has um, kept or maintained this minimum uh, stake of 25%, uh, then uh, the provision applies. And there is an exception, uh, and this is also new, for uh, the transfer of publicly traded companies, as long as um, the, the, the value uh, that is being transferred does not represent more than 3% of the value of the, of the listed shares. 
uh, we have to say that this provision uh, is not incompatible with the special tax uh, deferral regimes that uh, may be applicable according to the domestic rules, both in Spain and in China, in relation to third uh, reorganizations, the, the share for share uh, transactions. So uh, even though uh, uh, a company has more than 25% stake in another entity in the other contract in the state, if we are doing a share for share uh, transaction, uh, this capital gain may still not be subject to tax in the state of shores. We are going to see this uh, in uh, with a couple of drawings in the next slide. Yeah. So Grace, if you want to explain the, how the, the Chinese deferral regime works. Yes, sure, Brigida. Uh, so uh, China's domestic tax law provides a tax deferral regime for certain cross-border restructuring. Uh, apart from other conditions to be met, there are two qualified structures for Spanish investment in China. So on the upper left corner, a Spanish, uh, uh, this, a Spanish resident company transfers its uh, equity in a Chinese resident company to another 100% directly owned non-Chinese resident company. So although we use the uh, Spain code B as an example here, please bear in mind that the residency of the transferee company is irrelevant in this structure. And the, 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 the second qualifying structure is on the lower left corner, uh, that is a Spanish company transfers its equity in a Chinese resident company to another 100% directly owned Chinese resident company. So under these two structures, the transferred equity is accounted at its tax cost. No capital gain is recognized from the transaction and the tax is deferred to the subsequent transfer in the future. So uh, in Spain, uh, how this deferral tax regime works, and I'm now focusing on the uh, drawings in the uh, right part of the slide, is um, when there is a Chinese company obtaining a capital gain before, uh, because it is transferring shares uh, in a Spanish company, uh, so this capital gain uh, might be taxable in Spain according to this provision of Article 13 of the New Tax Treaty. Um, then in Spain, we can apply for the special tax referral regime and avoid uh, that, uh, the taxation of that capital gain only if the recipient company of the shares is a Spanish entity. So if it is an entity in any other jurisdiction, uh, China or, or any uh, different jurisdiction, the tax referral regime um, is not applicable in this case. Okay, and now a very quick remark on transfer pricing, because as you know, uh, both for both in the case of China and in the case of Spain, uh, transfer pricing is becoming more and more the focus of tax audits. So this is something that we that we need to know. Um, the, the new treaty as the former one establishes the principle that related party transactions must be valued at arm's length. And if they are not, Spain and China, when affected, will be able to make upward adjustments and to tax them accordingly. Up to here, nothing new. This is, this is the same as it was. The, the news here is that uh, the treaty introduces the possibility uh, for the other state to make a correlated uh, downwards adjustment to mitigate the double taxation. However, there's no specific obligation for the states to, to reach an, an agreement on this. And therefore, we will still need to see how this works, if uh, Spain and China will really negotiate on this, and how lengthy, costly, and uh, difficult these mutual, procedures, uh, mutual, mutual procedure agreements will be. Okay, thanks, Conti. Well, from now on, uh, ordinary credit method is established as the mean of relief of double taxation, and this change may have a major impact on labor income when individuals are declaring themselves as resident for tax purposes in both countries. According to our experience, this situation is quite common because of the difficulties we um, foreigners 
used to face in China in order to obtain the residency tax certificates together with the existence of two labor countries, uh, two labor agreements, one in China and another one in Spain. Well, from before now, this was not an, a big issue because by way of applying the exemption method, method we did not face a, a, a material tax cost of, of the, because of the existence of, of two uh, country of residency. From now on, uh, artificial double residency status will have to will have a tax cost, and therefore, individuals together with their employers should take the appropriate actions, such as uh, avoid double labor agreements, in order to uh, eliminate uh, tax cost. Great, right, Anna. So just uh, to close from from to close the the analysis of the tax treaty, uh, two remarks on anti-abuse rules. Uh, the treaty denies the access to the treaty benefits, and we can understand as treaty benefits the reductions, exemptions, or um, or double tax reliefs that it offers. When uh, it can be um, it can be reasonable to conclude that a certain transaction <clears throat> has been carried out merely to benefit from the uh, from the tax treaty. And this allows China and Spain to uh, assess cases uh, on a case-by-case -case analysis and uh, decide whether they can deny these, these access to the benefits. The other uh, anti-abuse uh, mention is uh, regarding Spain's and China's powers to apply their domestic legislation uh, when uh, preventing and assessing uh, tax avoidance. As far as this not collides, does not collide with any other provisions of the, of the tax treaty. So it is really important that we are aware of our domestic and internal anti-abuse rules. Grace, could you give us a, a, a quick update on which are these rules in China? Yeah, sure. So under the Chinese legal framework, uh, for corporate income tax, any arrangement set up by non-resident companies to indirectly transfer assets in China without commercial purposes to solely or primarily avoid tax obligations in China is subject to reclassification to treat the transaction as a direct transfer and the tax accordingly. And as for the individual income tax, it is worth mentioning, although for the first time in history, China includes an anti-avoidance provision in law for individual income tax. However, we still lack the detailed guidance on how to implement it. Uh, so up to here, these are all the discussions we have for the new tax treaty. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a, as a quick reminder of what we have seen now, uh, I would just uh, take into consideration four points. Uh, first of all, actually, uh, well, this difference on what, we, uh, on what is called a permanent establishment that should be checked by uh, uh, any company on whether actually there's a, dream, uh, a difference on uh, with actually their past circumstances. And uh, if so, actually, it, it's important to quantify the tax impact this would be actually one of the uh, first conclusions. The second uh, conclusion is about the dividends. I think actually there's a clear improvement uh, on the treatment of <laughs> dividends, which actually may encourage uh, some way actually investments on both sides. But of course, I mean, you should take into account also other considerations like, uh, uh, well, business reasons or commercial reasons, so that in some cases it may be worth actually to channel those investments from uh, other other jurisdictions. Huh? Uh, third, I think it's, it's very important also uh, uh, to actually witness that the new agreement is uh, seeking to favor exchange of commercial, industrial and scientific relationship. And uh, as a conclusion, I would say that actually, well, this is a good uh, uh, well, tax treaty, actually a modern tax treaty uh, adapted to the international trends uh, and especially to the OECD model tax convention, but uh, we, need, we, we have to uh, see how actually both uh, sides and in particular the Chinese sides is uh, applying actually this new tax treaty. And this is something that we will see in the future. And this may actually uh, well lead to uh, uh, some asymmetries, okay, uh, between investors of both, both countries. So basically just uh, after this, this first part, 
Uh, I think Grace will introduce to us actually this time at the tax updates. And please, if you have any question, uh, remember that you have you can you can ask them uh, actually directly to the chat. Okay, thank you, Amadel. So uh, in this section, I will uh, quickly bring you up to date the new regulations issued in the first half of this year. So the first tech policy I want to introduce uh, relates to the changes on the R&D expenses super deduction. So for those who are not familiar with this policy, under the corporate income tax law, uh, companies qualifying R&D expenses actually incurred during the R&D activities are in entitled to an additional 50% deduction before tax. So if the R&D expenses are actually are capitalized, the tax base for amortization of the resulting uh, intangible assets is 150% of their costs. So the purpose of this policy is to encourage scientific and technological investment. Therefore, R&D activities activities here uh, refer to continuing systematic activities with a clear objective to obtain or creatively apply new scientific and technological knowledge or substantially improve technology, products, services, and processes. So instead of uh, providing a specific scope for R&D activities, this policy works through an active list of certain industries and activities. Uh, more specifically, this policy does not apply to industries of tobacco manufacturing, uh, hotel and catering, wholesale and retail, real estate, leasing and commercial services, and entertainment. Also, this policy does not apply to certain categories of activities, such as technical support for customers after commercialization, repetition or simple modification to the existing products, services, technologies, or processes or market research, uh, etc., which do not meet the definition on R&D activities. So the updates to this policy are, first of all, since 2018, the super deduction percentage for R&D expenses was introduced from 50% to 75% or from 150% to 175% for the amortization of intangible assets for all qualifying companies. So this policy expired at the end of 2020 and then early this year, it was renewed until December 31st, 2023. And secondly, from January 1st, 2021, this percentage increases to 100% for R&D expenses or 200% for the amortization of intangible assets for all manufacturing enterprises. Thank you, Grace. May I make a, a closing remark to this issue? Uh, I just wanted to share with all of you that uh, in our experience, uh, we have to be careful with these R&D super deduction or <clears throat> R&D um, uh, related regimes, because sometimes we find that they are inconsistent with what we are doing at a multinational uh, group level worldwide. And these uh, may collide with our transfer pricing policies, perhaps. So what we see is that it's quite easy to access at the first stage, this, this super deduction or these other R&D related regimes. But then when we are challenged in a tax audit, it might be more difficult to defend that we are really uh, eligible to apply them because we cannot be doing R&D activities in Spain for certain purposes or for transfer pricing purposes, but then defend that we are doing the R&D in China for these other purposes. Thank you, Grace. Okay, thank you, Conchi, for your remarks. And uh, then the next tax policy I want to talk about is the VAT refund for the advanced manufacturing industries. So from April 1st, 2019, China introduced a VAT refund regime for domestic transactions, and qualifying taxpayers can claim a refund of undeducted input VAT credits at 60%. So this measure has a, a very direct impact on the cash structure of taxpayers. Uh, qualifying taxpayers need to meet certain quantitative conditions, which refer to a minimum incre uh, increment incremental VAT credit and also the qualitative conditions of a good corporate behavior, such as uh, have an A or B 
free tax credit rating, uh, did not commit to VAT fraud in the 31st, uh, 30, 36 months before the application, or were not penalized twice or more times for tax evasion in the 36 months before the application and others. So from June 1st, 2019, in order to further encourage uh, manufacturing industries, uh, taxpayers uh, in certain advanced manufacturing industries can benefit from the way to refund policy without meeting the quantitative uh, conditions. Also, the refund was, uh, was increased from 60% to 100%. Back then, the advanced manufacturing industries were uh, non-metallic uh, mineral products, uh, general equipment, uh, special equipment, uh, computer, compu uh, communication devices, and other electronic equipment. So uh, the update to this policy is that from April 1st, 2021, the scope of advanced manufacturing industries has been expanded to include pharmaceutical, um, chemical fiber, railway ships, aerospace and other transportation equipment, electrical machinery, equipment and, uh, and instruments. So uh, the last policy I want to introduce is the recent cancellation of export VAT refund for iron and steel products effective from May 1st, 2021. So the underlying objective for this cancellation uh, that on one hand aim at curtailed export of these products to meet domestic demands, and on the other hand aim to control the production capacity and force the product upgrade to reduce the carbon emission. So given these objectives, uh, this policy may be a long-term one. So the affected uh, products included include 146 types of iron and steel products that were granted with the VAT refund rates of 13% and 10%. That means following the cancellation, these exported iron and steel products will be treated as domestic sales by applying a 13% VAT rate. So Chinese exporters have already starting to renegotiate export price for the affected iron and steel products. Uh, so for foreign buyers, they may agree to take on the price increase or agree to bear the corresponding weight cost, subject to the negotiation of how the parties uh, share this cost. But that latter approach may have a slight advantage if the policy is reversed in the future and it will save having to renegotiate a price deduction. So therefore, it, it is advisable to review the tax clauses of the supply contract uh, to assess the impact of the merits and the possible remedies. Um, so this uh, will be all from me with the updates. Thank you very much, Grace, for these updates, which I think that they are certainly relevant, especially this latter one for uh, those in the audience who may be working in the steel and iron industry. So I think we ran out of time and we uh, should skip the Q&A section, uh, but uh, Amadeo, I really think we have this uh, um, mail in for any queries uh, that uh, may uh, be wanted to, to, to send to us and uh, we will reply to them uh, later on. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to, uh, to all of you then. Uh, just please check this, uh, this actually uh, mail address webinars.quatracasas.com so that uh, I think we will channelize all the questions through, through the mailing. Uh, I think it was a very interesting uh, actually webinar, so thank you very much. And hopefully, uh, I, I would just uh, to ask the, actually the, the participants if they have any other actually legal, legal question that may be of interest, please let us know. And we will be just very glad to check it uh, and to see whether actually we can organize something similar with, with Catholic classes. Okay, so of thank course. you very thank much. Thank you very much for, opening, for offering it, Amadeo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care all. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.